Amen. Thank you. Um, th thanks for coming. I'm really happy to be here. This is my first time in Vancouver, actually. Um, and I'm excited to tell you guys about GraphQL. Um, we're going to be talking about organizing complex systems with GraphQL. Um, but before we talk about that, I, I do want to talk just broadly around what GraphQL is, what is capable with it, why I'm excited about it, why I'm even on a stage talking about it, and why that dude at NPM seemed to care too. Um, so quick show of hands, how many of you guys have heard of GraphQL? Wow. All right, how many of you guys have like tinkered, touched, played with GraphQL? OK. How many of you guys are using GraphQL in production? All right, that's awesome. Um, so that's really exciting. I work, how do I make this thing go? There we go. So a little bit about me. I am a cloud systems engineer at Apollo. Uh, as a, sorry, Mike, what's your name again? Kyle. Kyle. As Kyle mentioned, um, we build a lot of open source tools around GraphQL, helping people to use GraphQL clients and servers uh, in production or tinkering around, making a lot of tools for that. But we also have uh, a commercial product and cloud tooling around that. And that's the kind of stuff that I work on. Um, and of course, because we are a GraphQL company, we expose all of our data with GraphQL. And so I think a lot about how to use GraphQL. And even though I'm a cloud engineer, I work a lot with, with product to help define the future of GraphQL. And I don't know if you, a lot of you guys have said you, you heard of it. Um, does anyone think that they could give a description of, of what GraphQL is? No? All right. All right. I got to take her in the back. Yes. So it's a standard of uh, questing and it's like uh, sending data back. We don't underpension the fetch. And you can put together other systems, other policy families, other servers, and one of each is what you've got to get. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you, those of you guys who didn't hear, uh, it is a, a language specific. I think I need to be closer to this thing to work. It's a language specification for data to, let's eh, skip that one. Um, it's a language specification of data to not underfetch or overfetch, to explicitly say what you want and uh, you know, how you want it, apply directives on, on the t kinds of data you're getting back, and it's completely agnostic to the databases you're using or the language frameworks you might be using underneath. Um, and that's, I think that's a great way to describe GraphQL. Um, but I feel like there's actually a lot more buried underneath. And GraphQL is, in, in my opinion, an enabling technology. And by that, I mean something that, that opens doors and paves the path for newer, bigger things to come. Oh my god. OK. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Maybe I just don't use the button. I gave a talk. This is my second talk that I've given. But I gave a talk earlier where the exact same thing was happening. And I just gave up. I think these things aren't for me, so I'm going to give up again. Um, so let me give you guys a brief history of GraphQL. A lot of you guys said you had heard of it, and that's really exciting because GraphQL was only launched and released less than three years ago at React Europe. Um, and at this time, people had maybe vaguely heard the word GraphQL if they were really closely following React. But it was kind of unleashed as this thing that was like, hey, we have React, and React is great. And by the way, there's this kind of annoying thing called Relay, and like, it's based around GraphQL, which is kind of cool. But like, eh, have fun. Have Here's React. Um, it was kind of like a side note about GraphQL. And uh, Apollo, I don't know if you guys, how many of you guys know the Meteor.js framework, out of curiosity? Nice. So Apollo is also the same company that built Meteor. Um, and it was around 2015. Those of you who know Meteor know that it's very closely tied to Mongo. And that was a big pain point for a lot of customers, because Mongo didn't quite take off the way we expected it to around 2015. Um, and we were looking for a universal way of talking about data. And when GraphQL came out, that's exactly what we, we, we saw about it. And we immediately went to work after 2015, and this was released, um, building a GraphQL client. And that, that's Apollo client, the like, number one most popular way of interacting with GraphQL on the client side, to, to fetch data, to have automatic caching, a lot of other uh, useful benefits out of the box if you haven't uh, used Apollo Client with GraphQL, it's honestly a pleasure. As I mentioned, I'm a cloud engineer, so I haven't used it much myself. But every time I do for like making demos or things, it's, it's honestly just so much fun. And it's so easy uh, to, to go into. And that was 
I think pretty much the, the first big project around GraphQL, the first big client that was open source beyond the open source of Relay in 2016. Uh, and you can see it's still growing year after year today at the same rate that GraphQL is growing. Um, and I'll, I'll mention this a couple more times. But we actually have our own uh, GraphQL conference that we host every year. If you guys are interested, you should definitely come. I have a, a promo code for some money off if you want an individual ticket to it. That's happening November 6th to 8th. Um, and we've been doing this since 2016. In 2016, there was like no one in this space. There were, there were four like r super early adopters. GitHub was into GraphQL. They were working on their open source API at the time. Shopify was the same story. And Coursera had been kind of working with, with Facebook as an early access partner and bringing their things out in the world. And Facebook, of course, invented GraphQL, uh, as was that last blog post. And what's crazy to me is in 2016, we had you know, four companies, one of which had invented GraphQL, who kind of knew it and were doing things about it. And now this is a, a small sample of everyone using GraphQL today. It's, it's really booming and, and taking off. Tons of people see a ton of value in it. Um, and I'm not here to, well, I guess to some extent I'm here to like rah, rah, GraphQL, because I think it's great. Um, but this is to say that this isn't, I think there's a lot of impressions of GraphQL as this like kind of niche technology. And from my perspective and from the perspective of all the people who I talk to, it's really taking off. And I'm really happy about it. Um, so much so that when I search for GraphQL, there are 27,000 different repository results on GitHub, which is <laughs> absolutely nuts to me. And, and also Apollo comes up first, which is also exciting. Um, if you want to get, if you want to learn more about the GraphQL community, um, and you want to get more involved in the happenings and the cutting edge of GraphQL, I do recommend coming to the summit. I'll send up a, a promo code at the end. I'm going to skip the outline because I didn't finish writing it. Um, <laughs> Sneaky, sneaky. So I want to start with the why and what of GraphQL, because I think a lot of us have used it, touched it, vaguely know about it. We had a good definition in the back. But I really want to understand why it is that we actually need this thing and what it is that it does itself as a language. Because Gra GraphQL stands for Graph Query Language. It's a language that we use to talk about graphs. Um, so I guess the first question is, why do we need a graph? And this is an answer. Data grows out of control extremely quickly. This is, so th there's a tool out there called GraphQL Voyager that you can use to visualize the data graph of, of a GraphQL schema, or the, the API contract. And so I, I took GitHub's GraphQL API, and you can't even see the, in, the individual elements are like little pieces of black on the screen. Um, and this is a, a, a visual representation of the GitHub data graph. And you can see it's not even complete. There are tendrils extending out into the ether, just doing other things with other data. And can you imagine one person, or one team, or even, even a set of teams managing all of this information in their heads at all times, and serving as the, the point of, of fact, of resource, for everyone on the team to have an understanding of what the company's data model is? It, it's crazy. You can't possibly put that in the, in the heads of developers and expect that to be a sustainable solution. So what do you do? You write docs. You write a lot of docs. And then you keep writing docs. And every time that you make a change to your APIs, you make a change to your data, you make a change to the docs. And you update your docs. And you start to build these abstractions and specifications around your docs to make doc writing easier. And before you know it, half of your job is doc writing on your APIs and on your data. Um, and docs are great. Don't get me wrong. I love docs. But I, I do think that there is a lot of value that's buried in these docs. These docs that every single company, every single team, every single person has to redo and recreate every time, build up those abstractions, those specifications, and that language of talking about data over and over again. So I think we need a, a universal way of talking about data. And this isn't actually a new concept. I think this is a very old concept. It's the concept of something called a lingua franca. Um, this, is, this is the definition I found online of a lingua franca. But what I remember learning in like high school and middle school, whenever I heard the term, is people for a while were doing business and like making like basically doing like business charades <laughs> uh, until they decided, you know what, we're all going to speak Akkadian. We're speaking Akkadian. That's it. I don't care whether you speak, uh, darn, I don't remember my ancient languages. 
Anyway, <laughs> whatever ancient language you speak, it doesn't matter. When you're doing business, you speak Akkadian. And eventually that developed into French, into English, into Swahili, into Chinese, and different areas. But the point is, when you're doing business, when you're making trades and communicating with people about a common purpose, it's really important to have a unified language, because you can get a lot more done. And I like to think of GraphQL as the lingua franca of data. Um, they're, you know, in essence, I think REST was a really great tool. It was made in 1997 off of a, a PhD paper um, talking about the, a lot of the same ideas, a lot of the same ideas of having a unified way of dealing with web APIs. But over, over time, the, the needs of our, of our data models and our companies has changed a lot since 1997. It used to be your one relational database with its hierarchical schema, um, and now it's not. Now you have tons of different databases and tons of different instances of those databases shared across different teams um, who all want to have some kind of unique identification across them. And so because of that, we need, a little, we need something a bit more universal. When we no longer have the monolith and the view layer, we have the services layer. We have a variety of different underlying services, some of which are external, like external dependencies that you might have on your OAuth partners, for instance. And then you have an app, but you don't have one app, you have tons of apps. You have your IoT devices, you have your web UI, you have your iOS device. Uh, and what GraphQL is, is for all of your services and all of your applications, the, the glue that binds together the capabilities and the requirements. Where you can map together your front end data needs to your back end data capabilities. But at the end of the day, it's a language. And like any languages, there is a specification, and it kind of looks like this. So because we've been talking about GitHub, um, I put an example of, of what some elements of the GitHub API might look like. So you have types. You have a repository. And in that repository, maybe there are pull requests. There are owners. There are teams or organizations in those pull requests. There are authors and bodies and commits. Um, and this is the data capabilities. This is the server saying, you don't have to know what microservices are underneath me. You don't have to know what databases I might be fetching. Um, but this is the data capability that I have. And on the right-hand side, you have the request. I don't care everything you can do. All I want is this information. For all the pull requests, I want the login of the author, and I want some information about the body of the text. So this offers us a few things. One is specificity. So that's what you were mentioning in the back. You don't underfetch. You don't, un you don't overfetch. You ask for exactly what you want. Now, this has a couple of really good benefits. One of them is just you're not asking your server to do more work. Um, and you can also go a lot quicker because you're no longer having to, because you get exactly what you asked for, you don't have to parse out all the relevant information and you know, spread it into some new object and put it back into your components. Uh, and things should also be faster. But you also have flexibility. It's no longer this strict hierarchy of uh, of ways for your data to interact, you can have any two elements and just connect an edge between them and expand your graph model as you go. More importantly, and this goes with the specificity, you can start to get an understanding of what data your clients are actually using, whether these are internal teams or external teams, because they ask for exactly what they want. You can start looking into your analytics and say, well, this field is actually never used. I can deprecate it. I can delete it. Whereas if you have a REST API, you don't want to touch that thing, because you have no idea who's touching what, of, uh, what element of it at any given point in time. And any change you make to it, any improvement, modification, uh, could be a breaking change for anyone, because you just don't know what's going on. There's another aspect of this which I think is really awesome, which is composability. Uh, and this is something that I don't think that there is, is enough work going on in right now, and I really hope it starts to, starts to boom and take off. And this is going to go with a lot of the rest of the talk. Because I want to talk about not just having a data graph, but having a complete data graph. Spoilers. Um, I, I really want to get into the idea of all of your data, no matter what it is, no matter where it is, should be in a graph, should be attainable. And at a certain point, maybe not just your data, maybe not just your company's data, but all of the data that you might need or anyone might need to have this universal graph that anyone can publicly traverse to get the information they need to do whatever work they want to do. Um, and there's this concept of schema stitching or schema composition, where you can say, I have these two data graphs, 
And I don't want to draw an edge between their nodes. I want to draw an edge between those graphs and merge those together, stitch elements of them into each other, and then create a new graph that you can extend in any which way you might please. Um, so for example, you might have you know, a remote schema of you know, products and categories and you know, things that you're using to do remote management with a REST API or a GraphQL API. And then you might also have your, your local information of your customers and your users and their carts and what ordering, uh, what kind of orders they have, and you can merge those together to have a complete view. And I think that by putting all these together, you get universality. You get the idea that all of your data from all of your different microservices and to all of your different clients can go through one layer, which in and of itself, in and of itself has a ton of value. And it has one of the values of literally just deleting those docs. Because if you have it, a well-typed language, you can now explore that graph any way you see fit, because you know how to read it. You know how to read and speak that language, and the clients you write and the applications you write know how to do that too. But hold on. I feel like we've heard this same story before, right? It's like, OK, we need universality. We need a new standard. I can't believe there are so many competing standards out there. I don't know if you guys have seen the co this comic before, but when I heard of GraphQL, this is literally the first thing I thought of. I was like, why is this going to be any different from any of these other standards that have come along and said, oh, yeah, we have this universal way of doing the things that you keep doing differently. And you have all your docs and all of your types and code gen and autocomplete and analytics. And then you end up just having to learn a new framework and a new language that not every team wants to use. Um, but I think that GraphQL is different. And the reason that I think it's different is because developers actually like using it. This isn't something where like, the CEO or the VP of engineering or R&D or whatever is saying, everyone in the org needs to be using GraphQL, and then people rebel. This is something that all of us in this room have heard about or tinkered with and are excited by because it's easy to use and it's fun to use. Um, and as an example, and fitting with the theme of GitHub things, um, there, you can actually use the GitHub API literally just by like, clicking login. And interact with it. Even if you haven't interacted with GraphQL before, this is a really easy way to get started, is find public APIs, just start executing things against them. You can just imagine how easy it is, especially with, with the right client support, uh, to jump in and just start creating things, to start automating the workflows that you might have around, like, for instance, I, I use the GitHub API to make a small bot that just nudged my coworkers whenever they didn't review something after a certain amount of time that I assigned it to them which was great. I like, didn't have to nudge them anymore. They got nudged on Slack immediately from, <laughs> from my little constantly running Slack bot, which of course is a Meteor app. Um, <laughs> but another really great thing is that there are tons of resources out there to learn GraphQL. This book just came out that I really recommend. I meant to bring a whole bunch of copies, but I didn't. Sorry. Um, I don't know why I even told you guys that. But <laughs> yeah, I was going to give you a present, but never mind. It's what you want to hear. Um, anyway, I really recommend this book. It's, it's on Amazon. It's out there in the world. If you come to the GraphQL Summit, you'll get free copies, though I'm sure you paid to come to GraphQL Summit. So there's that. Um, there are online resources up the wazoo. This is only a very small selection of them. And a lot of these are actually taken from the fourth link on there, Awesome GraphQL, which is this great uh, repository that just has a humongous list of all these different kinds of ways of get, getting started with GraphQL, learning a little bit more about it. Um, GraphQL is really community driven. It has, you know, we saw like, what, 27,000 repositories, if I remember correctly. Um, one of our missions as GraphQL is, is to bring, as Apollo, is to bring GraphQL to the world by making tons of open source tools and really focusing on our APIs and making them easy to use. Um, all of our stuff is built in TypeScript. You can use it with JavaScript or TypeScript. Um, and w we really strongly believe in that language. But if you don't, that's fine, because there are specifications for literally every language for GraphQL. Like, I was surprised to see Lua and OCaml on, the, on this list. But like, they're there. And like, Haskell, like, it's all there. And you know, the, the normal things too, like Go and Java and Rust and Kotlin and Python and so on and so forth. So it's out there, and you can really easily get started building this stuff. Um, there, uh, there are tons of docs pages if you're going to use specifically our stuff and blogs. Um, so I recommend those if you're trying to get started. So we want to bring GraphQL to the world. 
but we also think that GraphQL opens doors. As I said, I think it's, it's really an enabling technology. And one of the things that I want to talk about in enabling today, just kind of as an example, especially as a cloud engineer, is organizing your complex infrastructure. Um, but first, here's this cute video of my dog opening a door. Applause, anyone, no? <laughs> All right, sorry. I don't think you guys saw it. We can, we can go again. <laughs> All right, fine. But she's great. Wait, did someone say it's not a cat? <laughs> All right, All right, fine. Um, so before I tell you about how you can use GraphQL to organize complex systems, let me tell you about my child, our own cloud systems at Apollo. Um, and we have this, this great diagram, which is super incomplete, but I really like it. And everything's on Google Cloud, which is why I'm here, because I love Google Cloud, and I love the APIs that they use to manage this stuff. Um, and we use Kubernetes on Google Cloud, and we have a whole host of different microservices. We, you know, similar to whomever was talking before about their event bus, we use Kafka, and we, we persist uh, its state to a number of different places, GCS, Druid, Bigtable. Um, we, have, we have a Kafka Streams architecture beyond that. Um, we have a monitoring that runs within Google Cloud. We have a number of different crons that are doing all these sorts of different jobs. Um, and it's our job as the infrastructure team to always keep this in mind. And how many of you guys out there work in, in the back end of, of web development? Okay, so you guys probably know that whenever you want to make changes to your system, and this is, the, I assume, on the front end too, but I don't work on the front end. You have to think really, really deeply about all the different moving pieces that you might be touching at any given point in time. And you have to be extremely thoughtful, extremely careful in the changes that you're making because any one of these arrows could be affected. And there might be a lot of arrows that aren't here, that are just implicit in, their, in, the, you know, in transient relationships and in transitive relationships. Um, so this diagram obviously makes zero sense to you guys. So let me tell you about what we actually do, what our cloud product is. Then we can look back at it, try to make sense of it, and then understand how we can use GraphQL to organize it. So back in, I guess, 2017, when we started building our product, we were like, we, we, we were really thinking about how GraphQL enables things. And one of the first things that we thought of it enabling was around that specificity. And that's exactly what you were saying in the back, around having the specific way to ask for data. And if you have a specific way of traversing a graph and asking for data, that means that you can also track the, and you can track what's happening in that request over time uh, as at each of those steps and get observability at a tracing level, which is usually something that you need to build in painstakingly in different servers to like, you know, put your tags in the right place and then correspond them by looking back in your code. So we, we thought that this would be really just immediate usage of GraphQL. You have, the, as I showed before, this is kind of like the, the query to get your information, where you have a repository, your name, owner, login, et cetera. And you know, on each of those steps, we're actually making, uh, we're walking down an edge of the graph, and on each one of those edges, we can measure the latency, and we can measure the error rates. So we started building in traces, and we started building in statistical analysis for you know, how your GraphQL servers are performing in the wild. Um, and then we build, build integrations for all those. I took this from like one of our marketing decks, just like putting it everywhere. You know, we, we're a developer tools company, and we understand that everyone has their own preferred developer tools for whatever they want to use. And we want to bring your data, whatever that might be, whether that's in Slack, whether you want to have your, your alerts in PagerDuty or in Datadog, uh, and also just directly in your IDE. Whatever IDE you might use, VS Code, IntelliJ, whatever. Bring that data in there so that as you're writing queries and as you're expanding your server code, you can have the insights you need to make the right decisions. Again, stole it from some marketing slide. Um, and there are other things that you can make universal that you can't do otherwise, like caching, right? You can say, like, on a particular type, this is actually its, its max age. It should always live 240 seconds, and this one, in fact, read by current users, should always be private. We should never share that publicly. And then when you make a traversal down that, that tree, no matter what elements you hit, you can determine at the end result how well cached that should be, and even partial results how well cached those should be, which I think is super enabling. To be able to put all of this kind of stuff in one place. You can imagine going 
like much further down that route of universal things you can build when you have a universal way to talk about all of your data. Um, I mentioned errors as well. Um, but another cool thing is collaboration. So we were talking before about like, well, if you have your REST API, you probably never want to touch that thing because you don't want to break your clients. But in GraphQL, that's not really true. You know exactly what fields are being used by what clients, and you can start to get the observability to make changes. And so you can imagine, this is not something we have, but something that I, I hope we have or someone has soon, the ability to have an automated workflow where you know, this, was, this actually came in on, on our GitHub, and I was really excited about building out an automation for this. Chung, who's a member of the team, who astute viewers might have noticed, is actually also the creator of NPM charts, which was shown on a previous slide. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really cool is he just was like, here, I had this query. I want to be able to ask for this data. You can't actually tell from this post, but some of this information is already in our GraphQL schema, and some of it isn't. And then he included the information that he actually wanted to like, show with this. I was like, wow. This is, this is a perfect situation. My, my teammate says, I has a query. I really want some data. Please, to give me the data. And then I can go off and build it. And we can, we can go our merry ways. And we can have a, a conversation and build the observability. It's just a door. OK. <laughs> and build the observability that we need. I'm just going to keep going. But I'll take this as an opportunity to take my jacket off. That sounds good. And so you can already do some of this. You can like start seeing your schema history changing over time, yada, yada, understanding, and like bringing those observability pieces together um, and build it, all that stuff right into your CI. So when you make changes, they're there. All well and good. Um, and you could see, like, you could see how GraphQL has helped to enable us to build this. Because along every single step, we're bringing together the information that we had. Um, and in order to do that, it doesn't take any extra work. When you want to bring together the information that we built over tracing, and the information we built over caching, and the information we built over errors into this schemas feature, it's all in, in the exact same API. We literally just draw an edge between it. We don't need to make a new API every single time or do any additional work, which is great. But the whole point of that was to tell you about our cloud our cloud architecture. So now we can take a look at it and actually see what's going on. So we have some like ingress into, uh, into our reporting server, into our Kafka event bus. And this is all the tracing and stats and schema information um, that goes directly into our reports, dumps into Kafka, and goes off to persistent storage. And we have consumers uh, that are trying to get information about that observability, or that are trying to get information uh, about your schema changes and your collaboration over time, uh, and that is mostly stored in these in um, in two places: one in Postgres to have that relational data of modifications over time, and also in GCS. So, like the huge schema blobs, just dump them in GCS. Um, and then, if you want to have this time series data aggregated over long periods of time, we have two methods of doing that. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. We have two methods. One is Druid and one is Bigtable, which we're actively deprecating. But then we have a whole bunch of third-party dependencies that aren't actually in our graph, right? So we have uh, the GitHub API, and we have the Recurly API, and Datadog, and Slack, and PagerDuty. And so I'm not, I'm not going to get deeply into this, but what I imagine as a future is having all of those things, rather than as these third-party dependencies that you're not thinking about, as elements of your data graph, of your data model, so that you can have all of them in one place. And all of the things that you're doing with them, you can actually cherry pick if you want uh, to have a more unified model where you know that you're using elements of your data graph. Um, but I, I really want to talk about, uh, this is just me crossing out Google Cloud Platform and put Google Kubernetes Engine. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, having your GraphQL layer be the home of all of your data. And so one thought I had is maybe we can actually add that diagrams data into our graph itself. So that information was what was internal or external and uh, what their actual end stores were, whether it was GCS or Druid or Bigtable or Postgres or local state, didn't matter. 
it, we all wanted to be encapsulated in that diagram. And when we made that diagram, any time that we make additional information, I try to think to myself, how can we have this in one place? How can we have this in our graph? And so the first idea I had was a custom directive. And I, I, I like started building this. But most of this stuff is like all work in progress. Some of it was done on the plane. Um, and an example of that is cache control. So I mentioned before that you can have caching observability. And you do this actually via a custom directive. And I kind of showed this a moment ago, and I glossed over it. But the idea is there's a, a part of the GraphQL spec called a directive. You guys know what a directive is? Uh, I see some, some heads nodding. Um, but the basic idea is that you can have this at symbol, and it will make a runtime modification to your, your schema or to your resolvers uh, to append some additional metadata to your graph itself or to the responses that come from it. So as an example, this does both of those. You say on each type and on each field, if you care to, what, their, what kind of cache control information is there. And you assume that fields that aren't specified under a type inherit from that type. And likewise, uh, if a field overrides the type, then that has its own, uh, its own specification of cache control, which could have a TTL, and it could also have a scope. And then as you make requests and give responses, there are actually results returned in uh, GraphQL extensions. And we use GraphQL extensions a lot. Um, just like we were talking in the last, uh, in the last hour around you know, building onto the Google platform by making apps, you can build onto the GraphQL platform and not wait for the spec to catch up with any cool ideas you might have by adding custom directives and by adding extensions, which you can make any kind of custom extension you want. And I really recommend playing around with this. If you have cool ideas for the future of GraphQL and you just want to tinker, it's really, it's really quick and easy to add this. There's a great blog post out there. Um, if you just search up GraphQL custom directives, you'll find it. Um, but the one that this does is it adds a whole bunch of hints to your cache control, where it says on every single path what the max age is and the scope if it's private. Uh, and if the scope isn't specified, then it's assumed public. So I had an idea of what if we take this idea of a custom directive and apply it to exactly what this diagram was doing, data sources. And what we do is on all the types that we have that's talking about data persisted somewhere, we add the data source. Not for external use, not so people who are reading, who are consuming our data graph from somewhere else can know it, but so that when people come on board on our team, they can start to understand where all these different things are coming from. Um, and we can start to understand how we can swap them out or what their kind of relationships might be and what their latency characteristics might be, even if we don't have the metrics on them quite yet. So adding in you know, five different data source types, um, some of them that I mentioned before, and a custom directive on each type. It's pretty simple. And then you could take a couple of the elements. I took this like, directly out of the, the project I'm doing over our, our own GraphQL API and specifying the, the data source for each of these ones um, so that when you get a response in the extensions, you get something like this. For a query that you're running, um, like, you know, like service, stats, and traces, you can see what all of these different things are hitting. And that way, when someone joins our team, they don't have to look at that diagram. They can look to that graph to have everything in exactly one place. Um, so how many of you guys are like, this is weird. Why are we using this graph to expose like, private internal implementation details? Isn't the entire point of an API to be separate? Anyone? That's kind of how I feel. Yeah, right? I feel a little weird about it, too. But I thought a little bit more about this, and I thought about back to this diagram. Um, and it says client and server, which kind of puts me at a bias. I kind of think like, oh, this is all, like web APIs are web APIs, and like that's all they are. But when I started to think of GraphQL as actually just a data graph in any sense, I realized that the clients can actually be anything. And the servers, you don't need to think of them as servers and REST APIs and microservices. You just think of them as capabilities just like we said before. And when I started thinking of clients as our internal teams who are consuming this graph, uh, and you know, likewise later on, of the whole world consuming the entire world's data graph, um, having this kind of information and being able to you know, turn it on and off for certain different parties makes a lot of sense to me. So I really strongly believe that your GraphQL layer can be the home of all of your data. And I know that's not 
the current way of the world, the current way of the world is you make your team's graph, a little like GraphQL thing, and then maybe you build that out to encompass the rest of your org's data. Maybe you build a whole bunch of different ones and you compose them. But I think that we could have everything in the graph. Like, there's no reason that we couldn't have all the information in our Google Sheets and our you know, Google Suites app that we were just talking about exposed via GraphQL and merged in so that you can explore it and navigate it no matter where you are in the organization. So the second idea here, in case it wasn't clear by, by my hinting, is the idea of schema composition. Um, so taking the other dependencies that you have, like a dependency on GitHub, for instance, if you are a developer tool like we are and you allow people to OAuth via GitHub and consume their organizations, or maybe the dependency on G Suite. If you, are, if you have integrations with the Google platform uh, and have you know, different app scripts that are running for your different customers, for instance. So going back here, we can stitch those together um, just like I kind of showed before and put them all in one universal GraphQL API. And as an example of that, um, this is an open source project that I plan to release in the next few weeks is a way to expose your own Kubernetes cluster and its information as a GraphQL API that you can stitch into your overall universal graph. Um, so how many of you guys use Kubernetes? Nice. All right. I really, really like Kubernetes. Um, and it was really fun to make this, or to start building the schema for this. And I, I decided on a model kind of like this to start out, where you can slice your cluster via some filtering mechanism, starting out just with a namespace. And then each of those namespaces, get your pods, get your deployments, get your services, get your stateful sets, you know, walk into them, get their types, get their logs, and be able to, from a deployment, walk into its pod, and from a pod, walk back to its deployment, and you know, make a any kind of loop-de-loop -loop you want around in your, uh, in your Kubernetes graph and you know, append additional metadata into that. Like you can imagine building in that same information that we were working with with our data sources and managing our own internal infrastructure in you know, a private internal data graph that helps to onboard the rest of your teams and keep that, all that information that is in diagrams and in docs in one universal place. Um, so this is what I think a lot of the future is around GraphQL. But I'm really curious how you guys feel about the future of GraphQL, and if you guys have any questions about the stuff that I was talking about, because I know it's kind of out there. But yeah, in the back. So let's say you have a contact, uh, contact like book, and you'd like to get the relationship of one person who knows another person who knows another person, or maybe you have a simple graph. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, and let me make sure that I understand what, what piece of that question you're trying to ask. So you're asking, you might have a graph, especially if you have you know, a very dense graph with lots of different edges where you try to get relationships, you end up with too much information, and you need to filter it down even more. Um, so there are two parts of that. As a user, how do you make sure that you're actually getting the information that you need? And then on the other hand, as uh, someone who's exposing that information over your API, how do you make sure that your API is secure and not handing them tons and tons and tons of information and falling over with you know, this, this depth of complexity, right? Um, so on the filtering side, if you need a better ability to filter or to search, um, I think that is exactly what that kind of collaboration would be, where Chung sent a pull request being like, hey, I need this data. And I was like, I, I got you, get you that data. Um, and it'd be that kind of thing where you have advanced filtering mechanisms and uh, limits on what's actually being returned and pagination. You start to build that stuff in. And on the, the limiting side of making sure your server doesn't give too much information, I think there's actually still a lot of work to be done. Um, though, though a lot of it has been done in a few different server implementations around some kind of complexity base of rate limiting so that you can understand for any traversal of the graph you say, I definitely, like, you can do what you want. You can traverse it however you might feel like it, especially if it's a public API. Um, but up to a certain point, we're going to say that's too complex. If you run that, it's going to be too risky for our server. And you just stop them. You limit them. Um, and over time, you know, similar to like 
a, a DOS situation, you just have a rate limit over complexity rather than just over one request. Because the way that you handle rate limiting in REST is you treat every single request as the same amount of complexity, but you can't make that same assumption with GraphQL. So you need to have some kind of understanding of how expensive it is to do a graph traversal. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I'm kind of new to uh, this stuff. Uh, so all of the stuff I've done on the internet, mm -hmm. it's all like React, front end, and GraphQL servers, right? Uh, but I'm actually interested in, in no front end together, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can use the, the client to make any kind of request. And, and in fact, it, it's just, no, it's, it's just an HTTP post. You can use curl. You can use whatever you want. Oh, of course. Yeah, so you can use Apollo client and you can have that, that caching. I think the things that you might be missing out on are like the browser side caching because there are a lot of implement, like there's a lot of instrumentation around that. But you can still hook directly into the cache itself. And as I said, that's not something that I exclusively work on, so I probably couldn't tell you the, the like, semantics of, of doing it. But I know that there, like, pretty much everything is pluggable. So there is, you, you can add in an external memory store, keep the local memory store, um, and modify it, and do whatever you want with it. Um, so um, would it be irresponsible to use... my favorite question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can you can you be more specific? Okay. Um, like, who's managing the Kafka cluster? Uh, so what I want to do, I want to set up a power. I want to set up set up a uh, a pub sub system mm -hmm. where we um, we use back end with Kafka, right? So we be streaming data, right? but a client will be picking up all the updates in real time, right? Over yeah, I think I think for that you would probably want something like a subs a subscriptions like WebSocket model, and you would like I think I mean I, I guess you could use Kafka that way and have like though as I guess the point of my talk isn't really about Kafka, but I do like talking about it, so I'm happy to. Um, I suppose you, you could just create a consumer that always reads like right off the top of the queue and like create lots of different consumers for every single call and like for. Each call maintain a subscription connection and do something like that, but it does. Because as as your point of being irresponsible, I don't really know. Uh, because the, uh, server does support subscriptions. Support yeah, yeah. I think it's the only one that oh, it's in the spec. So the the reference implementation supports it. I think most servers support subscriptions. It's like in the GraphQL specification. Yeah. Um, Oh, okay. I, if, if so, then I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I'm not. I'm not. It depends on what you need the event bus to do and like what the architecture is. But subscriptions are great. I think one thing that people often get confused about with subscriptions is they they feel like it's only WebSockets, but you can instrument subscriptions however you want. You could have webhooks. You could your subscription could literally be polling. It's just the specification of saying we're going to constantly keep sending updates and update the client about the information that's happening on that event. Yeah. Can you speak up? Uh, yeah. So there, the question was, do you know about libraries that can help to create your resolvers? Um, and so it's. Depends on what you're actually using as your data store underneath. There are probably a lot of people who have, like, there are people who have built ORMs on top of different databases. So, you know, if you have a Postgres or a MySQL database to just be able to, like, do a transform over that and expose a GraphQL schema from it and then limit that down into, you know, the set that you actually want to expose, because you probably don't want to have your entire SQL schema <laughs> exposed via GraphQL, and then you can merge that in directly. So there are a lot of different ORMs that kind of 
already speak GraphQL that you can use directly. Um, but I would, I would say the easiest way to do it is just to get started and try to write a resolver. It's just as easy as you write in your, at your REST endpoint of, you know, I want to get some data from a database and I have my client to do it, or I want to get some data from external REST API. There's a lot of instrumentation around that. Like, if you already, like, one very common use case I've seen is people have a really great REST API that already does the things that they want to do. Um, and they're like, well, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but I would love to get this, you know, into GraphQL. And so there are easy ways, even with directives, uh, to, to do that directly. So that you can have a field and say, like, at rest, which is like that custom directive, and put in the, the URL and the arguments that you want in order to get there. So stuff like that definitely exists. Yeah? Can you talk a little bit about how can you uh, capture some Akamai CDN like, uh, like Oh. Yeah, yeah. So th the question is, well, GraphQL is great, but one of the nice things about REST is there's caching on CDNs, right? And there's a whole environment set up around how to do caching. And so the way that you do that with GraphQL is using something called a persisted query, which we, we recommend everyone do in production anyway. So that language that I was showing of, you know, here is a query and there are variables and, you know, you are specifying exactly the data that you want. Uh, the way that you usually send that with GraphQL is with an HTTP post um, with the, the body being the query. But if you've already sent that, a query to get the information once, the server can give you back an ID and you can remember it um, and then send it as a get in the future so that the CDN will cache it automatically for you. Uh, Yep, that's right. Yep. Right. Um, it's not exactly the, the cache, though. It's, it's like an identifier. So the way that it works is the, the, well, your GraphQL server maintains its state via Red S memcache or locally, saying, oh, I see query foobar came in, and foobar is great, and you can send args for foobar. And I remember foobar, but instead of asking you to send me foobar over and over again, which with an HTTP post, you can just send me the ID for that query, which is 147. And then you can make get requests with 147 with those same arguments and use it just like you would a REST API with HTTP gets. And it will automatically set the, the cache headers, like the cache control headers that it gets from those directives that I was showing. No, it's automatically handled by Apollo client and Apollo server. If you don't have an external cache, it'll do it in memory, which just means for all of, like for each of your replicas of your server instance, it will have to see that query once, which you know is probably fine. <coughs> but yeah, it's handled automatically uh, in those libraries without any configuration, which is cool. The configuration that you would need is that cache control to say on each type how long do you actually want it to be cached. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns, comments, dance moves? No, so. I do have one. So basically, like the pattern that we're like currently seeing is basically like GraphQL was always sort of like between the client and server kind of stuff, right? Just based on your problem, I feel like you're kind of proposing for it to be like microservice to microservice kind of contract as well. Yeah. Um, do you have like any like production experience with that, or like do you see how that goes with like between microservices? Yeah, um, so we have a number of customers who are doing it that way. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to name them because I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to, but in addition, we also do it that way. So we have two different microservices in our GraphQL API. And if I went back to that diagram, I could actually show you which ones those are. Though it's not explicitly stated. So like that API gateway and engine GraphQL are actually both GraphQL servers, poorly named. But the gateway manages all the schema information, and the engine GraphQL manages all the metrics information. And then we stitch those together in one layer. Um, so that's something that we do, and we have a lot of success with it. Um, so, and it's something that a lot of other people are indeed doing. So I, I do see it as a future. I think that, I think you should be able to do it that way or any other way. Um, the reason that I like that form is you can start consuming 
other public GraphQL APIs as well. Or REST APIs and wrap them in GraphQL. Yeah. Are you kicking me off the stage? Yep, got six minutes. Okay, cool. So do you want to do Oh, yeah. Just so that's, thanks for reminding me. So I have a whole bunch of shirts. I don't know exactly how to give them out. Open to ideas. I meant to give them out to people who ask questions. I don't remember who those were anymore. <laughs> All right, you got one. <laughs> uh, you want to come up here and grab a shirt? Yeah, if you ask a question, come up here and grab a shirt. Some of those fall on the floor, though. <laughs> uh, what size do you want? Uh, large. Sure. All right. Uh, sure. You can. Thank you. Sizes are limited. All right. Thanks. All yours. Thank you. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Are there... Huh? Do you still have any questions? Uh, if you guys have questions, I don't want to like force you to ask a question for a shirt. <laughs> that seems contrived. Um, cool. Well, the final thing I'll say oh, there's a question? Yeah, I mean, I think what you said is, in fact, a, a decent first step, is taking your REST API and putting GraphQL over it. And that can start to prove the value internally of saying, and it's really low effort, right? You're like, we already have everything. We're just wrapping it. We're just like proxying it, essentially. Very low risk, and you can prove the value early on. And then you can say for the next project that you want, uh, exposing it directly via GraphQL rather than wrapping it in this REST layer and um, kind of going you know, forward in that regard. Um, as I mentioned, like GraphQL is definitely being adopted by like from the developers up, not from like the CEOs down. Though in some cases, it's totally like uh, I think SurveyMonkey was one of these. They were like, "We want everyone to use GraphQL," and everyone's like, "Okay, let's do it." Um, but usually, it's the other way around, and it happens gradually, team by team. And that's why that microservices approach works really well because the teams are used to owning their own REST APIs, and then they need to have a way to stitch them together. Yeah. Did you get a shirt? That's two questions now. It's two shirt now. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Having a slash on there. Yeah, uh, I mean, one, one approach is it could literally be the first entry point into your GraphQL schema, right? Like, like yeah, like the, after a query, you say the version. Eh, that's, an, that's an idea, and if you don't specify, then, then you're on the most recent version. You could build it directly into the graph itself. I'm not a huge fan of it being in the URL because the entire point is that it's all in one place. Um, but I think the biggest thing with GraphQL is if you're doing it right, then you should never need to version things because you know exactly what clients are using what information, and you can just delete those from your API and never serve them again if no one's using them. As long as you like, broadcast that you're deprecating them well ahead of time. Well, the, the problem that we're facing is basically like that, like those mobile clients are using like the old fields and stuff, but that can never delete and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem that we're running into. And yeah. We don't have a good solution for that. Ah, uh, one thing that kind of works, but Maybe, well, actually, I think something that would work for this is something called like, an idea of client awareness, so that you can say, all right, some clients can use this field if they like, tell me their special client code and like, do a special client handshake, but no new clients can. Um, and that would be like in, in the next level of deprecation. So the way that deprecation works in GraphQL right now is if you mark a field as deprecated or a type as deprecated, it's just like it doesn't show it to you when you're exploring the graph, but you could still use it and it just like, outputs a warning. Um, but it could be a client level of deprecation where only current clients, and there's a, some handshake that has to occur to authenticate a client, does that. Um, 
I think that handshake part is a really flimsy bit, though, because how do you really know if a client's the right client? It have to be like some ephemeral kind of thing, but yeah. There are thoughts. Yeah. What's up? In what cases would you not use GraphQL to basically sum up the weaknesses and drawbacks? Um, yeah, so I feel like I should have a really good answer to this question because it's something that I've heard before. Um, can I proxy to the audience? What do you guys think? When to not use GraphQL? Or at least which types of databases or systems benefit the most from transitioning to GraphQL? Large ones? I mean, from my point of view, it's like, it's completely agnostic. I think what probably wouldn't benefit from GraphQL is if you already had everything in one place and you just had like, exactly like one database and one REST API, and that was it, then it's like you kind of have a lot of the benefits of GraphQL already. All of your data is in one place, and there is exactly like one set of documentation around it. So maybe that, and there's only one team that's maintaining it. Like maybe that would be a reason, like if you already had that, not to rebuild it. But the way I see it is if you expect to grow, which if you have data and you're a company and you're exposing it, you intend to grow, like, it's a much more sustainable model growing than REST. So I guess the answer would be, if you don't intend to grow, then <laughs> REST is great. I don't know if that's the most satisfying answer. Feels a bit cheeky, but <laughs> that's how I feel. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it.